A rough week for the Pacers with two losses after they were riding high. Lots to diagnose about what's going wrong with them, including Chris Duarte's absence, plus Sabonis is playing well. The Hornets tonight. Lots of fun topics to get to on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in and happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News, and today, today is very fun and very special. Uh, besides that the Pacers have lost their last two games and are struggling, which will be a lot of the focus today, got to talk about that. Chris Duarte's absence hurting the team. Uh, Sabonis playing better despite the struggles recently and more, but this episode is special because joining me to do that, the new Pacers beat writer for the Indianapolis Star, Mr. James Boyd himself. James, how's it going, man? It's going good, man. Um, made the trip to Detroit Wednesday night. Um, it, was, it was a trek, but it was fun to, to get another game in person, obviously, and we have lots to talk about. I, I actually introduced you poorly. I meant to say the best dressed uh, indie star <laughs> beat reporter, James Boyd, as Rick Carlisle affectionately called you. I think he's just buttering me up, man. We'll, we'll see what, you know how he is when I got to write some articles. Maybe he and the rest of the, the, the team so, and fans don't like. There you go. I might be the only person curious about my leadoff question here, but I'm still going to ask you. So when you, when you were in Detroit, were you the only person in the room for the postgame presser? Just you and Rick? I was. It was me, Rick, and... I believe like a Detroit Pistons person there just to get like audio from what he said. So, um, yeah, you know, they were saying, you know, if you show up in person, you get free reign as far as asking questions. So I made sure that I had three or four lined up for every person that came in and you all, you know, obviously heard some of them, but yeah, it was a pretty awkward. He walked in, he's like, (laughs) like, no, no New York, but you come to Detroit. Like, well, Detroit's drivable. He's like, Oh, okay. Gotcha. So. I was on the yeah. Zoom, and, J- and James was taking over. I mean, I didn't even have anything to ask when you were done. I was like, well, <laughs> that was everything from this game. Because James hit all the points that – well, and Scott asked the physicality question. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, this team was riding high coming into this week. And, you know, you looked at the schedule when they were 6-8, and eight, and I was like, oh, if they win in New York, they could beat Detroit and be 500. Like, that was kind of the, the thought of for mm-hmm. fans. And now they're 6-10. and 10. They've had a horrible week. They scored 10 points in the fourth against New York. I think Detroit was probably their worst performance of the season, maybe – in Toronto back in October, one of those two games. So this team was a sphere. They were rolling. Now they're a cube, and they have completely stopped rolling, and several problems prevail. But, James, what do you kind of feel like is the biggest thing that slowed this team down? Not having Chris Duarte. <laughs> I mean, if we're <laughs> just talking like tangible differences, um, you know, he's a guy averaging 14 points a game, one of their best scorers. I feel like he's proven, you know, even on like an off night, he'll get you eight to ten points. And um, they've needed that, that scoring. They needed that, that athleticism. They needed that on the wing. But then intangibly, it's it's what, you know, Carlisle talked about after the game. It's what I wrote about. It's like my um, sidebar after the game, my, my second story. Um, the toughness, the tenacity, the ferocity, none of it was there Wednesday night in Detroit. I mean, you're at, you're at Detroit. This is the house where, you know, they had the bad boys and they got Ben Wallace and um, you know, even Rick Carlisle was asked about it, you know, before the game because, you know, Ben Wallace is going to the Hall of Fame and he coached him and he's like, you know, he went on this soliloquy about how tough he is and then comes out and you see nothing from them, you know, outside of that third quarter, maybe a little bit early in the fourth quarter, but lackluster effort and they really just got bullied, you know, into a loss. Yeah, the it's weird. Like they had this in the, ironically, the Toronto game, the other one that was one of their worst performances, at practice the next day, we got to talk to Sabonis, and he was like, yeah, we're getting out hustled and getting our butts kicked. Like, it shouldn't happen. And then Scott followed up, and he said, you know, I, I don't know what, what it's going to take to get us to do this, but they, he had to hammer it into his teammates. Like, guys, we got to be ready to go in physical from the jump. And then the next game, they looked a lot better. I, they still lost. I forget who they played the next game. Someone actually good. They still lost, but it was, like, much better. And then they went on their run and. In November, right? So I'm wondering, we only talked to Rick uh, at practice uh, today, yesterday for you listening, and he kind of said something similar, like we got to kind of be more physical in these games after the Wednesday game. So I'm wondering if, you know, even though the Hornets are are clearly good and are going to beat the Pacers this year, we'll see an, an improvement in that area tomorrow night, especially because in general, the Hornets are not necessarily the most physical team. 
Right. And then secondly, I mean, you saw how the season opener went. So that should that should ju juice you up a little bit there. Just just knowing that you blew this big lead and, and had one slip away, which they've had a couple ha happened a couple times this year. Um, but I do think that if we don't see any injury tomorrow night, you know, or, or for those of you listening tonight, you know, Friday, I don't know what to say. I mean, Rick Carlisle called his team out. That's basically what he did. Um, I believe someone asked a question about, you know, ball movement or, or stagnancy. And he's like, this isn't a ball movement issue. You know, this is a play hard issue. You know, that's, that's verbatim pretty much what he said. So when you got guys who aren't playing hard, I mean, how do you correct that? Is it innate? Is it is it a culture? Like, I don't know how you fix that overnight, but, I mean, these are professional basketball players. They should not be having to be asked or questioned about their effort, you know, as opposed to, like, their execution. Yeah, Tristan Thompson just had a great quote about playing hard and not needed to be motivated to do so. I'd recommend everybody look that up. To your other point about their struggles, and I had this on our itinerary for today's conversations anyway, Duarte not playing – I didn't think it would be this impactful, ironically. Like, they have their four other starters healthy. So, but and Duarte wasn't a team last year. So, I thought they'd be a little worse, but not this much worse. And a, a basketball term that I've been turned on to this year by people who understand what's happening way more than I do is the term release valve, where, like, if there's a ton of pressure on the ball handler or the strong side action, guys on the weak side are got even close to the play, whatever, guys who can just make a play on a quick catch when the when the action is dead are really valuable. And T.J. Warren's really good at that, and Duarte's been good at that this year. But I thought, you know, Justin Holiday can maybe fill that role a little, or, you know, we've seen Keelan Martin really step up. But uh, without Duarte, they, they've had a lot less impact there, and they've definitely lost a lot on defense. And I hate to be this reductive because lineups play a factor and your opponent plays a factor. But with Chris Duarte on the court this year, Pacers, plus 33. With Chris Duarte off the court this year, Pacers minus 40, right? Like sometimes it's that simple. They're getting smoked without him and they're winning with him. So I think his absence has been huge and they're really missing him on both ends. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, you know, Keelan made his first Pacers start against Detroit, made his first shot. And you think, yeah, hey, it might be a big night and missed his next six and didn't score again. However, he did. I thought. Excellent defense. Uh, right. A wonderful job on, on Jeremy Grant, who's an Olympic gold medalist for those of you out there just won, you know, this past summer, you know, Grant, he's not, you know, your marquee Team USA guy. And I feel like it'll be like a, you know, a trivia question at like a, a random party <laughs> years from now. Like, Him oh, and Drew Holiday. Right. You remember like he actually got the gold medal, but um, that's a gold medalist he won against. And this is a third year guard, you know, so who's taking kind of the long route to be where he is now. So I didn't expect him to step into the starting lineup and be Chris Duarte or to, you know, simulate everything that he did. Um, but I do wonder, you know, again, we've talked about all like, what does, can this team be anything if they're not healthy? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a broken record at this point, but it's really, really hard to even gauge any type of progress. And I know what you're going to say. Welcome to the beat. Welcome to Indiana. Welcome to the Pacers. I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll wait till you're done. <laughs> Everyone in my mentions keeps telling me that on Twitter. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's like my oh, most my liked tweet of the last month is yeah. I said, welcome to the beat. And like oh, man. They're, they're really, I mean, they're, they're struggling without him. And, 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 you know, even Carlisle said that, you know, Duarte's rating out metrically. And, and for those of you out there who don't like analytics, just use your eyes. He's a very good player, a very good young player. He's got size. He's got length. And like you said, he can kind of bail him out sometimes. I don't feel like they have many bail out players. Justin Holiday, they played very well off the bench, and I think that he should keep coming off the bench because he's not – I mean, I looked at the splits on basketball reference. Anyone can check him out. He is a considerably better player when he comes off the bench. I, I know I asked him about it. He kind of didn't put too much stock in it. I mean, which player would. Right. But he is better off the bench, and it's just at this point, you wonder, like, how serious is Duarte's shoulder because I keep asking every day. I know Carlisle's probably going to get mad every single day that I keep asking, but I have to ask. You know, is he going to play? And it's like a day-to-day -day thing, and we'll see if he uh, is good to go against Charlotte. Yeah, that's, that's how I know you're on the beat because you're asking every day. Like, you – two years ago when Vic was hurt, oh, man. It wasn't even, like, every day. It was, like, multiple reporters asking it a slightly different way every day. And I felt so bad for Nate McMillan because he was so patient with us and always was providing updates and giving answers, but it was like, how's Vic? How's Vic? How's Vic? He doesn't care. He wants to talk about basketball. You know, it, it's just how it goes covering this team, unfortunately. I feel like Duarte's trending in the right direction. I think you get the same sense from Rick, but I don't really know 
I mean, you could tell after the Sacramento game, I think that's the one I could see him holding it in for the first mm-hmm. time that he has been a little worse since then. So we'll see when he comes back or when he's able to, what kind of impact he can even have, although he was still playing fine. Right. So we'll he, he has traveled with the team. So it's not right. like he's just like, you know, this afterthought. He's going with the team. I'll, you know, doing my little, like, just looking on the bench last night. Like, how's he looking? <laughs> and he's, you know, he's moving around fine. Spirits are high. So I don't think he or the staff think it's that serious. Um, at the latest, personally, I feel like he will be back, you know, Monday, uh, you know, at Chicago. Hey guys, one little quick break here so I can talk about the good folks over at Prize Picks with the best NBA DFS props on the market. They offer more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator and offer all the superstar players as well as bench players only recording a handful of minutes each game. Prize Picks offers any prop you can think of from yardage to touchdowns, even interceptions thrown. And all the users that deposit and use the promo code I'm about to say will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. Just be sure to use the promo code NBA, when you sign up, you pick two to five players, pick an over-under on their projections. You can go up to 10 times on any entry. It's just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. They have safe and fast withdrawals. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com today and use that promo code NBA or go on your app store. Download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, two other guys I want to talk about with the struggles before we move on to a, a player who's played positively to me in the last couple weeks, kind of unheraldedly because of his expectations. But one guy for struggles is Karras. Uh, Karras was awesome right when he came back from his injury. And I think I mean, he was asked to do a lot less at that time. And then, I mean, since his first game, his splits are really bad. He's only even gotten to 50% shooting in one game. So since his first game, ignore the very first game he played. 37, 38% from the field, excuse me, 38% from the field, 23% from deep, 77% free throws, right? So he's taking more shots than points he's scoring in that game, only 3.7 assists, so less than the average with the Pacers last year. And I've asked him this after two games because I'm I'm just curious how he's thinking, but like he likes the shots he's getting, and it's similar to the ones he took last year, which is a lot of, you know, good-looking threes or shots from 5 to 10-ish feet. They're just not falling this year, whether that's a defensive pressure or a tension thing or whether that's the way he's getting them. And he's even said he's not quite 100% back yet from the back injury that he's missed time for twice this year. But, I mean, he was really important for them last year. He averaged 26 points a game over their last 10 games last year. So seeing him struggle this much has been really tough for them when they've lost by three in Denver, by five in Portland, by however many they lost to Detroit, and only scoring 10 against the Knicks. Like, all those close games – if he was just a tiny bit better, it would have helped so much. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it, you know, after the game and my five reasons why they lost. And, you know, he had a, a really great third quarter stretch there where he scored 12 straight, kind of took he had, over. He had three minutes where he was the best player on both teams. And that yeah, was- exactly. I mean, he, you look up and it's like, oh, wait. Because, you know, I was taking some notes during the game. Like, are oh, they on 12-0 run? And I'm like, wait, he's on a 12-0 run. Like, he's, you know, that's that's him. Um, so one of the things, or at least he had scored 12 straight, I think it was 12-0, but just 12 straight points. Um, one of the things about Karras that I've noticed, uh, especially in person, is like he gets he gets one-on-one too much sometimes. It's like, all right, the ball's moving, and it'll get to him, it'll stop. And then he'll pass out of like last resort as of as opposed to like making a play. So I think that the ball tends to stop in his hand sometimes. I don't know if that's like him just trying to like force his way into a rhythm. Um, but I personally think that there is probably three or four shots he's taken in each of these last few games that he just shouldn't take. And I look at him like, that's a bad shot, you know, from an NBA player, from anybody. That's that's not a good decision. Um, granted, I don't know if he's like pressuring himself into having to be more, but it's like, you don't have to be 26 points per game, Karis LeVert, right now. You know what I mean? Like, you, And then you're probably not going to be that guy every night on this team, you know, if everyone's healthy. So I think that he has to just stop, like, shot hunting so much and trust his teammates a little bit more. He talked about a little bit after Miles had the three-point game against New York. Yep. He's like, you know, we didn't get the ball to the second side a lot, and I personally felt like I had the ball kind of stick in my hands. Um, I felt like Karis is a very um, honest guy. He's not like he's going to – you know, shy away from any criticism or, or, or like deflect any blame. Um, however, it, he's in a tough spot because you want him to like keep working his way back. But at the same time, it's like, man, if you don't have something, just give it up. I mean, he shot 10 threes last night. I'm sure all 10 weren't good, you know, shots. You had a couple of room out here or there. But again, I don't think, you know, going into a game, I, I feel good about Karis LeVert taking 10 threes. 
None of them were like terrible looks on their own, but it's like at best he's a league average shooter and he's taking 10 like that. Mm. You know, that's kind of part of it. And that's kind of why I'm asking him about his shot selection too, is you mentioned that he's passing kind of last year's order. It's like with that kind of stuff, we don't know without asking very specific questions. And often coaches won't tip like this specific of strategy, but we don't right. know, like, is this Karras being aggressive or is Rick Carlisle saying, Hey, you're our best off the dribble score. Like, go attack, you know? So I, I don't know. There's no, it's not a blame thing, but I don't know what is inspiring him to take some of the shots that he's taking. But certainly at least from our perspective as viewers, some of them are ill-advised, right? And he should be passing more. He was passing more last year when he was on that hot stretch of scoring. Of course he was hitting more shots, but he was also Brogdon wasn't playing and Turner wasn't playing. Right. So he was a very prominent option in the offense. So mm-hmm. I think there's a balance thing for him or at least playing within the flow of the team a little more that needs to ha- come happen. And I think it will. He's really good. He just hasn't been in the last couple of weeks, which is tough. Yep. One more vet, Justin Holiday. I mean, look, Justin Holiday, sage vet, oldest guy on the team, excellent shooter when he's feeling it, uh, has really been a big part of this team for the last couple of years, never misses a game. That said, for being their best shooter, he has shot over 40% in a game from three, three times in 16 tries this season. Uh, and 40% is a pretty good, like it's a good bar. It's it's like not, not everybody can achieve it, but... For a guy who shot over 40% from three last year, I think two years in a row with the Pacers, actually. Uh, let me double check that. 40% two years ago, 38% last year, excuse me. So two good numbers. You expect better than that. And he was on fire in those three games. So his season percentage looks good. But I don't think that's telling the story of him very well, or he's been really inconsistent in a way that has killed their bench unit or the starting lineup when he starts. So while he does play better with the bench for sure, his inconsistency is really slowing this team down. I'm, I, and I think – a part of that, is, and I alluded to it earlier, is him being a starter or a reserve, having to kind of switch his own role right. due to the necessities of the team. I think that's why Rick Carlisle experiments with starting Keelan versus starting Justin, because the numbers really do show he's a better player when he comes off the bench. Um, granted, I also know that he's pretty limited in like his offensive arsenal. Like he's, I mean, he is for for most, you know, ninety percent of the places out there, a catch and shoot type of guy. He's not going to take you out to dribble. He's not going to like pull up for a mid range. He's going to be a catch and shoot type of guy. And so when he's struggling, I don't know like what the remedy is. And honestly, I, I feel like it's just you got to keep shooting. He's a guy who's been in the league now for a while. He's a veteran. Um, like you said, oldest pacer or whatever. So it's not like he's going to change anything about himself now at this stage of his career. He has to keep shooting. Um, he, I think that he's for the most part taking good shots. And that it comes down to like the cliche of it's a make or miss league where it, I mean, he just got to make shots. I don't, I don't, I don't think if you asked him, or even if we asked him directly, like in a Zoom call or after practice, hey, what do you have to do better? He'll probably just say, I have to make shots, and that's exactly what he said after he had the hot game against Philly. You know, he's like, you know, they just went in. You know, nothing's really changed as far as his his you know role in the team. But um, again, I think that coming off the bench and being able to just come off the bench consistently uh, with some yeah. type of rotation will help. And then it begs the question against Charlotte. Will he start? Because Keelan's start was not very good offensively. I was going to ask you, this is my follow-up. I would guess Keelan starts again, though, right? What do you think? I, I would. I, yeah. I'd, I'd leave him in there. Unless Chris because, is back, of course. You know, it wasn't like he played terrible or he was like this, you know, deer in the headlights, like afraid or scared. He didn't look afraid or scared. He just he missed shots. But he competed very, very hard on the defensive end. And I think that that will – that alone should get him another shot at starting. I feel like he would have to come out and play bad for them to be like, okay, this is right. going to work. He did not play bad. He just had a pedestrian game on offense, basically non-existent. But defensively, he had a couple of strips and stuff that led to fast break points, led to layups, led to extra possessions. So I think that he's fine. Um, and, and, I mean, again, you, you can't really knock the guy because, again, he's coming into a role starting where he probably didn't expect to start this year. So – there's a lot of um, you know tangoing going on and musical chairs with you know the the starting lineup and I don't envy Rick Carlisle or, or Lori Pierce or anybody on that staff any anymore because I mean we can all Monday morning quarterback and say should have did what it did could have did but scheming and trying to figure out your best lineup night to night when you have guys in and out night to night is is not something that's easy for any coach I don't care who it is you know what else is not easy. Uh- shooting well when you have to guard Jeremy Grant and Sadiq Bey and Cade Cunningham all night. So that's kind of why I think Keelan gets another shot at a start if Duarte's out because, I mean, 
even if Miles Bridges is his matchup, that's tough, but that's still easier than what he had against Detroit. So mm-hmm. a good chance for him to fit in and, and, and prove his worth in the rotation again. Well, Chris is out. Something positive, James. I got a positive for you. And this guy, okay, Sabonis has been an all-star two seasons in a row. So his expectations are way up, right? Yeah. So that's why I kind of think when these kind of stretches happen where he doesn't have any insanely good games, he just skates under the radar. Sabonis' last 10 games, 17 points, 12 rebounds, 3 assists, lower turnovers, shooting 55% in that stretch, and has been clearly the Basers' best player to me in their last week. Uh, Plus minus in the positives, all four of their last four games. uh, Is getting a little more involved in the offense in ways that he wasn't early in the season. Uh, You know, he's a key release valve when those double teams came last night against Malcolm, right? He's finally rounding into form, and I kind of think that they're going to keep kind of pushing him to have the ball a little more as they try to get back into form again. I think that he is doing just fine. You judge good players based off of what they do in their bad games. Yep. What do you have, like a 15 and 11, you know, in, in a bad game against Detroit? Um, or not even a bad game, like a, a game that maybe he doesn't think is his best standards. I mean, that you had a double-double. You know, you, you, you've made some, some positive plays. So I think he's doing just fine. I think also with the way the NBA is, with the way sports is in general, he's not a guy that's going to wow you. Sabonis so is not going to come down and dunk on anybody. He's not going to have, like, some dazzling no-look pass like Jokic. Um, you know, he's going to have some step-back three like James Hardy. You know, he's a lefty. Um, but when you look at the box score, he's like, oh, dang, this man had 12, 13 boards. Oh, man, this guy had 17, 18 points. It never really feels like that. Um, but I do think that he is a vital part of this team because he's probably the one guy I would say, him and Malcolm, you can pretty much pencil in for what they're going to get every night. I feel like they're the two most consistent players, um, probably because their their roles are, are mo- most clearly defined. And, you know, in Sabonis' case, he's proven that his, ro- his role leads to individual and team success. I mean, the guy's been an all-star for a reason. He's probably on track – you know, if they win a couple more games here to, to, to be in that all-star conversation again. And I feel like once you get, a, you know, one under your belt or two, you start to get, like, more respect around the league as well so you don't have to, like, fight and claw for it as much. So I feel like if the team is able to turn around, win a few more games, be a, about 500 or above at the all-star break, he could be a guy in that game. But, I mean, Sabonis is, like, the hard hat guy. Show up, go to work, and then you look up and it's like, oh, like, this guy, you know, punched in, punched out, and, and did his job. <laughs> One more break so I can talk about the good folks over at Built Bar because if you're like me, you love Thanksgiving and are a fan of good food and you like yummy desserts, but they're so full of calories and sugar, it's the perfect time for Built Bars, 100% covered in chocolate, delicious protein bars that are perfect for the new holiday dessert. One slice of pie has 300 calories or way more. Most Built Bars, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar with plenty of protein. Replace the coconut cream pie with coconut Built Bar. Replace that raspberry built bar instead of pie. Lots of good flavors to replace any pie. Low carb, low calorie, low fat, but high protein, real chocolate protein bars. They're delicious. Tons of listeners have told me they absolutely love them. You can share them with your family, make them try them at the holidays too. There's going to be tons of new flavors over for Built Bar all month. So go check them out. Go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15 when you check out to get 15% off your order. That promo code again, LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Yeah, unfortunately, um, being the best screener in the NBA does not get you on Sports Center Top Ten. So, <laughs> I feel like every screen that goes on Sports Center Top Ten is like a moving screen. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah. he's going crushing screen. Like, oh, it's like, well, he moved, you know, three feet it, to the side. The screens, whatever. the NBA screens that make Sports Center Top Ten are like a right guard pulling. And like, yes, there you, you go. Know, <laughs> like, wait, that that was not legal. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Sabonis is the best screener in the league to me, or like top three, whatever. You can quibble over a few guys, but that's where he's really good. He's been good cleaning up on the offensive glass in the last two weeks or so. The only I, I can critique him for missing a few bunnies, and he has never been like this before. Like mm-hmm. sometimes when he has the, got the open, like he can see the rim pretty easily after an uh, offensive rebound, he just dunks it. And mm-hmm. this year he's having a couple where he he's got that. He just goes like. Floats it up. YouTube people can see me doing a hand motion. And he misses it. And it's like, that's... Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you were against Detroit like that, where you're like, okay, that's that's six points. You know, that, and that's big. That's, that's yeah. In a game that's that stagnant with offense, that low. I mean, people who watch the game or, you know, in my case, I was there. This was not like some offensive explosion by Detroit. It wasn't like Detroit actually played all that well. 
there was a lot of clanks in that game and a lot of bunnies around the rim because of those clanks. Like someone's get the rebound, he throw it up there, he missed, and he looked like the sky, like what is going on? So <laughs> I don't expect him to keep doing that. Um, you know, he's he's a proven guy in this league. He'll be better. And again, I think that that should give, you know, Indiana Pacers fans and honestly the team itself some comfort knowing that, again, you know what you're going to get from Sabonis. Miles has had the no dunks like that problem for years where he goes up soft mm-hmm. and those open ones. But Sabonis, it's like, wait, you have never been like this. It's very, right. and he missed a few against the Knicks too. You're like, man, he never misses that one, you know? So, yes, yeah, so I agree that not only is he playing well, I, even when his six point game against the Jazz was probably his best defensive game of the season, like he's really putting together some performances. So, I expect that to continue. And he kicked the Hornets' ass in the first game of the season. Mason Plumley is not a good defender. So, a uh, very good chance. He had 33. And 15 on opening night. I expect him to be very good tonight against Charlotte, who will probably, again, have no answers for him. Let's pivot again. Another bench player. Uh, everybody wrote the same story uh, because it was the story, uh, right? Mm-hmm. On Sunday, the Pacers, or on Saturday, the Pacers beat the Sixers, and McConnell sealed the game at the end. He had six points in the last two minutes. And that was his, like, fourth amazing TJ McConnell game in a row. And I think you and me and Scott and the Athletic all – TJ McConnell piece, right? Like, we got to get this out. He's killing it. And then since then, he's been kind of stuck in the mud again. And, and I'm kind of puzzled as to why. I know he's, you know, getting the ball a little less because both Brogdon and LaVert are playing. But uh, do you feel like he's lost his groove? Is it a role thing? You know, what's kind of shifted for him in a way that made him go from four games over 15 points in a row and then in a game where he seals in the clutch to one for eight uh, with two points against the Knicks and then two for six against Detroit? I think that teams know that he really can't shoot that well. So if you're able to force him into some action on the perimeter or basically like just force him to take an open three, like I would, you, you win that, that, that play, you win that, that scenario. Because I mean, I haven't watched a lot of TJ McConnell over the years. I don't know how many people, you know, turn on NBA game to really watch TJ McConnell outside of like, TJ McConnell fans or people that maybe know him personally, but he really cannot shoot. I mean, I'm not being rude. It's just outside of like his, he's a nice mid range, nice, you know, jumper around the basket. That he kind of floats up over the bigs. When he shoots threes, it is, you know, it's like a set shot and it doesn't look good coming off. And I don't know how much you can, you can do with a guard who can't really make the defense pay from the outside at that size. It's not like he's going to be able to like drive in and, and, and Ben Simmons you to death with layups and stuff like that. So I don't know. And honestly, he's better than Ben Simmons right now because Ben Simmons obviously isn't playing, but um, yeah, I just, I think that teams, you know, if I'm scouting, you know, against Indiana, I'm thinking if he's on the floor, whatever we do, don't, you know, we're going to try to keep him out of the paint, but we're going to force him to be a shooter, like force him to shoot outside of 18 feet and you win that play. Um, and it's not a knock on TJ McConnell. I don't think he's ever going to be a great three point shooter, but there were some shots last, you know, not last night, but he was recorded on Friday, but you know, on Wednesday night where he's wide open and it's like, it looks like he had no chance of going in when he releases it. So maybe that's part of it. And maybe it's just him coming down to earth. He regressed a little bit. I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to average like whatever he was. No, no way. No way. <laughs> Um, and I actually didn't, I had a couple of like little notes on him. I didn't do like a full blown story. Um, oh, I actually okay. did actually ended up doing one on, on holiday cause he had the big night off the bench. And I actually, I was like, man, like, I, am, I, am I missing something? Everybody else is missing. And, um, it, it's not a big deal. You know, you have beat writers and you pick and choose two different stories, but I, you know, I did. And like everyone else tweet about it a lot, did write my fair share about it too. Um, but I don't think he's like lost his magic. I just think that teams are scouting better i mean he he, he kind of won that stretch and it makes you think like okay tj mcconnell's you know coming in here now on a streak he's probably the easiest guy of their bunch to slow down and now it's like you know what are you going to do when you get an open three because again you have to be able to make a wide open three in the nba you should make one out of every three or something if you're a guard yes scouting and role are the two biggest things to me because on the road trip right there was uh no malcolm Mm-hmm. With Strep for a few games, so he was starting. And when Mal comes out, he can play without Karras a bit and just have the ball, mm-hmm. right? Because in that Knicks game, really what you're talking about came up where the Knicks were like, T.J. McConnell's in the corner without the ball. Like, don't even look at him, right? 
Mm -hmm. He can't hit that shot to punish them, even if it's a wide open corner three. And he, he's gotten better at the three this year, still weak, a point. Mm -hmm. Like people are going to leave him open. So the role change certainly inflated his stats when Malcolm was out and Karras missed more games with his back injury, right? No doubt that that helped. The other thing for me is, I think you had started on the B when Miles said this, but someone asked Miles about McConnell, and Miles was like, yeah, I think when he's in there, teams expect him to pass. So they're closer to their defender, and then he can get his shots more. And I agree. And then that kind of has stopped in the last couple of games where teams are like, wow, this guy is scoring 15 or more four games in a row. Like, watch out. When he gets inside eight feet, he's actually threatening. And so now teams have cut off that option when he gets in the paint and make him make a different kind of play. And so mm -hmm. in the last two games, we've seen the Pacers have to go, oh, crap, the, this reliable, you know, go to the water, go to the well and get water every time play isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hurt McConnell's effectiveness. So I think he will recover. I mean, he's been good for this team for two years, but definitely a struggling week and kind of showing that flawed players can be consistent like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. I and mean, you look at the team again, a lot of that has to do with lineup changes, continuity, chemistry. Um, it's hard to build that. But I do know and everyone knows this. He's not going to be a guy that pouts or gets upset about minutes right. or a role or whatever. He's proven that whatever op, you know opportunity he's given, he'll make the most of it. And on top of that, I mean, at the very least, he's going to give you great on-ball defense. He's going to pick up 94 feet. He's going to play super hard. Um, I know it's a cliche for like, you know, Frank, he's being like white small point guards, like the Aaron Crafts of the world. It's like, oh, he's so smart. He's so hated. Like, no, I'm not being cliche. Like, TJ McConnell is legitimately – in the NBA, because he probably scraps harder than a lot of guys his size, makes good decisions, makes good plays. And now it just comes down to making defenses pay if they sag off you. You don't have to be Steph Curry, Damian Lillard, Seth Curry. Um, you just have to be able to make you know a shot here or there to keep them honest. That's all it is. Keep them honest, and then things open up more for you and the team. I did not expect to hear Aaron Kraft's name ever again. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I watched him at TBT over the summer. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy is still playing. So <laughs> that guy um, was at Ohio State forever. I think the yeah, funny thing Perry Ellis are probably like, you know, yeah, they're probably on their tenth year. And imagine if like COVID hit during their their college year, they probably would have been there for yeah. enough to like become like the president of the school or something. I think the funniest tweet I've ever seen was something like, I found this picture from Aaron Kraft's freshman year at Ohio State, and it's like a black and white grainy image of dudes playing basketball. I <laughs> lost it. That, I felt like he was there for forever. And it was Very right fitting. when IU was actually good, too. So I actually watched him, and, and yeah, he terrorized them. It was it was pretty funny. All right. I'm sure you're tired of this question, but I got to ask you anyway. You've yeah. lived in Indy now for, what, three weeks, a little over yeah. three weeks? You like the city? Do you like this team? Uh, how are you feeling about the job so far? I feel good. I feel like people keep asking me, like, what, what do you like about the city? I haven't had time to really see the city do a lot of stuff. Um, it would have been different that had I like got the job before the season started and got to like ease into it. Now I've kind of just hit the ground running. And the biggest thing I've been trying to do is like finish up like, you know, training and, and figuring out travel plans and, and stuff like that stuff that I would have already had like set up. I'm trying to catch up with on the fly. So I haven't had much time to like go around Indy. Um, I did actually go to the mall the other day. This the center hey. circle mall or something. Yeah, like circle that. center. There you go. Yeah, circle center. Where your office is. So I, I'm glad you walked yeah, around. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they would like actually go to the mall and look around and see what stores are there. Not that I'm like some big shopper. I was just trying to find like, a couple shirts for work. But um, other than that, it's been pretty chill. Um, I've noticed that I had to drive a little bit more to get to places. Um, unless I'm like you know living. Obviously, I don't live right downtown. So like. Whenever I GPS, like, okay, where's the UPS store? Where's, like, the, you know, my bank? It's like, oh, wait, like, let me GPS one that's, like, three or four miles away because that's the one I don't have to, like, pay to park to go to. Right. Um, things like that. So it's fine. Um, and as far as the B goes, um, all of you have been pretty gracious, pretty nice. Um, those of you who don't know, Tony's been uh, helping me as far as, like, where the heck do I go when I go inside, you know, uh, Gamebridge Fieldhouse and things like that. Where the heck is the media room and, and what's, like, the protocol for this types of thing. So that's been very helpful. And – I think the, the most fun thing I'm looking forward to now or is just getting on the road and, and being able to go to different venues and see how their setup is. Like I said, I was surprised to go to Detroit and be courtside. You know, I mean, I'm like, wow, I'm getting more stuff at a road game than I would get at a home game. Um, and it just depends on protocols. A lot of COVID stuff is still different. For example, going to Detroit, you had to fill out this COVID form before you went to be allowed inside. You had to go through a, like certain doors. And that's for everything, but like, COVID is still a very big thing and it's still like affecting a lot. So I think that I'm hoping that, you know, with booster shots and things like that, we can 
hopefully maybe next year or at the very latest the year after that, get back to more like, you know, intimate things. And it's hard to like, you know, get some of that stuff when you're when you're just in a regular press conference. But right. overall, it's been fun. Team has been fine. The fans have been great on Twitter. Um, I, I've done the whole the gift thing. I love it. And, you know, yeah, you know, send me your gifts, and I think that I'll keep doing it for the rest of the season, win or lose, because it's just so funny. And I think that Patriots fans are very like self-aware of what the state of the team, state of the game. Um, and I love, and I, I'm probably just like pushing the needle, like press somebody's button, but like I try to tweet like that out. When like I know it's like a moment in the game where everyone's like tense or something like yeah it's one way or the other, um, last few minutes we'll decide it. So like and I and I don't have really have time to check it during the game, but like when I check afterwards, I'm like I got like forty responses. Of people just like you know be laughing or having fun with it. You know obviously they're not like pleased if the team is losing or something, but it's fun just to engage with fans. I'll keep trying to do that just because I don't want to be like this guy who writes about the team who's never I'm going to talk to anybody who cares about the team. Um, but overall, fun man, uh, no complaints at all. And people saying like, "You drove to Detroit, like, why would you?" Drive? It's like, dude, I get paid to go to basketball games. Life is good. Uh, yeah, I've never, I've never covered a road game before, so I'm, I'm envious of your. Well, on Zoom, I have, but not in person. Mm-hmm. So I'm envious of your Detroit tripping. But well, I'll tell you what, you know, me and Rick Carlisle you. just in the same room, uh, a little awkward, you know, because you're thinking, oh, don't ask anything dumb because you can't, like, you know, hide your camera. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're right there in person. But overall, it was cool, man. I feel like, you know, everyone was uh, pretty gracious. And I got to meet some people as well. You know, I think that's one thing I'm looking forward to as well is just getting to meet so many different writers that I've read, you know, since I was in, like, high school and stuff like that. Like, I met Vince Goodwill for the first time at, um, you know, at, at the Detroit Arena, which is Little Caesars Arena, which is a terrible name. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's something I'm looking forward to as well. Reading their stuff, trying to get better, and obviously trying to bring, you know, you all, the readers, the fans, the listeners, the best content possible. James is killing it so far, I can attest. And I, we always pay it, it forward with the media rooms because Jim Aiello, who was on the Colts beat, actually, before you joined the Star, he was doing Pacers for a little bit, and he showed me where the media rooms are. So, in turn, an indie star guy actually did show you where everything is. That's just how there it goes. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Transitive property. Trans- exactly, exactly. So, it's going to be an interesting uh, weekend of games. I think that they can beat Charlotte and New Orleans. Like, they certainly should beat New Orleans, whose record is terrible. But they just lost to Detroit. They stunk it up against the Nuggets without their three best players. Nothing about this team surprises me anymore. So, we'll see what happens. James. I've already said where you work and your name a million times, but where can people follow you and all your stuff? Uh, check me out on, at Romeoville Kid, Twitter, Instagram. Um, obviously, I work for the Indie Star. My stuff is always on the website. Um, it goes up pretty fast, too. Like, this is all new to me to have a couple of different editors looking at my stuff. Before, it was usually like me and my editor. But now, when I write something, it goes up like pretty fast. So, you know, whenever there's news, something like that. Make sure you check the website out. And obviously, check out not only my work, but the rest of the work on the beat because um, I feel like I, you know, like competition like breeds more competition. Like, if I want to read Tony's stuff, I want to read Scott's stuff. Um, as Pacers fans, if you're listening, you know, that's all stuff for you all can, 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 to consume. And, you know, I'm going to try to keep bringing it and obviously get better at it and have fun with it, man. I mean, like, like I said, it's basketball, it's the NBA, it's the Pacers, you know, franchise that has people's numbers retired and, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, it might be a struggle now for, for fans, but for me, I'm undefeated. I haven't lost a game yet since I've covered. So, um, you know, I, I haven't lost a game since my three years of starting professional writing. Um, don't plan on it anytime soon. If anybody ever gets upset, if I'm writing about a team that's losing, trust me, I do not care. I just care for players to be healthy, you know, like Karis LeVert and Chris Duarte and all those guys. And hopefully um, more than they, they can get healthy, we can see really what this team can do. I lost two games. Uh, once when I asked Evan Fournier a terrible question, and once when Rick Carlisle asked me what planet I'm from, and you were there for that one. So, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, well you know Rick's a little. I've learned he's a little prickly, um, but he's. Got I love really that cool. though. I love it. He's got like a sly sense of humor. Like I think that if you don't know his sense of humor, if you just meet him, you might think he's rude. But he's just a dry type of guy. Like, I think he just that's what he gets off on, um, which is fine with me. I, I you know take a couple shots here or there, you know. I think that he made a little mark today about, like, you know, that James in his car. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, this is James in his car. Cause I just, you know, went to cover your game the day before. And unlike them, you know, who probably have all these buses and things they can sleep on. And I was like making sure that I got enough sleep. So I don't, you know, drive off the road on the way back. So um, yeah, big week coming up. I think that I'm excited about the, obviously the Monday game against Chicago. Um, just cause 
I mean, that's where I'm from, and I'm excited to see them in person. But um, you just never know, like you said, with this Pacers team. They might come out and 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 lose against Charlotte and then, you know, win against Chicago. Like, it's just – I mean, a week, a week ago we were asking, like, are they turning a corner? And now we're asking, like, are they turning a corner? Like, you know, a different corner. So we'll see – what happens, but I think the biggest thing like we led the podcast off with is tenacity, energy, effort. If that's not there against Charlotte, I think we have a problem on our hands as far as covering this team. And, and obviously as fans, um, some frustration will tend to boil over. You've, you're watching guys not give their best effort. I agree. That was something the Pacers were always good at under McMillan is, look, even when they were bad, they were going to give the paying fans a show because they're going to work their hardest every damn day. So I, hopefully this weekend we see them turn around and come out with that. I think we will, but this team has proved me wrong before. Of course, this podcast is on Twitter at Locked On Pacers, and I am there at T East NBA. Please follow James and all his stuff. I'm sure uh, he, I don't know if he'll be at the game tomorrow, but I'm sure I will see him on Saturday, which I'm looking forward to. Everybody have a great weekend, and I'll be back on Monday.